start to think of some different things. Uh, we can begin to share. So if you could log into Schoology, and then I can give you the access code. So our access code for our group, I'm going to this up, it's going to be KJSZK dash 7TK D8. And to join a group in Schoology, if you go to the top where it says group. Spot that says join, and in that space that says join, ask you for the access code, and then you'll just type in that letter number 10. <clears throat> and again, this is just a space where we kind of put a few resources. There's also folders available for our group now to continue and add materials as we go forward. We'll begin with introductions and we'll get started. My name is Matt Zoko. I teach fifth grade at Lakes Elementary. This is my 10th year teaching. I taught fourth and fifth, back and forth. Um, I've never been in the grade level for more than five years uh, at a single time, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. And Math Workshop began as an idea about seven years ago few teachers and I were sitting after school saying, how do we make this better in our building? And out of that, it became organic in the building and we started to branch out and tweak and adjust and make this model kind of each our own but following a similar <coughs> pattern. So today, hopefully, you'll be able to understand our why and our how. And I'm Lauren Arnett and I teach fourth grade at Cannonsburg and I have been in fourth grade my whole teaching career, um, and this is my 11th year. So um, I've done a workshop in very different ways throughout the past, oh, probably since my second year, just realizing that there was a need for different things and different groups of students need um, those different ideas and different groups. So um, we're going to start out, like the man said, talking about um, the why. So for us, the why and that kind of mentioned too, um, the biggest thing for me that started me thinking I needed to do something a little different than a whole group lesson for math every time was my students needed different things. Some of them came to me at a point where they needed some remediation, some of them needed some acceleration, and some of them were right at that lesson, right where they needed to be. Um, also, some of them needed extra practice, or some of them needed these, all these little extra things, and I wasn't able to provide that with the time I had when I was doing the whole group lesson. So for me, it became an issue of how do I meet all my students where they are and get them to improve within our math time? Yeah. One of the big things, too, is, as Lauren said, I used to sit behind my projector long ago, and then it turned into an Elmo, and I just used to instruct. And the kids sitting in the audience would say, slow down, or they would be bored. And I went, something's got to change here. Something has to be different. And that difference allowed me to recognize this math workshop model, and this gave me that understanding of, let's go at something different. And so then, obviously, you can, you can read through the slide, too. But um, looking at the other idea of that individualized instructions, so like I said, all kids need different things. So how can I have something set up so this child can move on and do something that's appropriate for them, and then something else set up, and how do I manage that and put it all together? Um, and then, obviously, the student interest. If I can get my students all doing something that is right for them, their interest level is going to go up, and they're going to be more invested in what we're working on. Um, Another part of it for me was that continuous assessment. How do I make sure that they're there and make sure that they're progressing? Um, and that workshop model gave me that chance to assess them quickly, do something that I could kind of group them with, um, an assessment ahead of time, which we're going to talk 
talked about, um, but then making those groups flexible so that it worked for my group. And to add on to that, it is so different to know your student as a math student before the chapter even begins. So with this philosophy, we pre-test and we pre-assess and we figure out where they're at. So I'm already, before the unit begins, knowing where these students are at. We can give the discovery ad, we can look at uh, MSTEP or MEEP results from past times, and it kind of paints a picture. But in that unit, you know exactly where these students are needing to go, how to extend, how to add content material, and how to pull aside and grow them in their math understanding. And then the final piece was just management. For me, having you know different years, having 30-some students in your class, how do you manage meeting all those students and making sure that they're understanding and checking in with them? Um, if I'm doing whole group every lesson, I can't check in with them. I don't know if they're all in the right spot. I don't know if they're all understanding. So just that management piece of how do I get to all the students every day? And that's a big thing, too. Class sizes have been monstrous at times. 31, one of my biggest classes in workshop, saved me. I can pare that down to a group of 10 sitting on the floor with mathematicians, and I can have individual discussions with them through the lesson in a smaller setting, knowing that I'm hitting the objective, the purpose, or the specific skill in that role. That's huge, because when they leave, they feel empowered because they've been able to ask questions without embarrassment. <laughs> they've been able to get their answers to the needed um, pieces along the way, but again, just having that small, intimate setting as a math student, it's huge for so many as they build their confidence. This little guy in the corner here is Mr. Dewey, and I've used him for I don't know how many years talking about fractions, but I'll share this and you can watch it later if you choose to. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works in my room, and like I mentioned before, every year it seems to change. Every year I have a different group of students, every year my math workshop looks a little bit different. Um, but I kind of tried to show you a snapshot of the things that I do that have worked. Um, so the first thing I always do is pre-test the unit. Um, and I also look at their unit tests from the unit before so that I can see, okay, what concepts do they, did they not fully understand from the unit we just did? And where are they at in comparison to the other students and with the concepts that we're looking at in the unit going forward? So after I do that, then I put them in groups and look at each standard and what the units or what each lesson is teaching. So if that lesson is all about fractions and comparing and ordering them, and on their pretest they showed me that they knew that, then they don't need to do that lesson, so they're gonna do something that would extend the concept. So just making sure that my groups make sense, and we always talk about in our class, it's a flexible group, and the group could change by the day. So if there's one student, and it typically is, I have one student who doesn't need a lot of support throughout the unit, and then there's kids that kind of weave in and out of that. So finding things for them to do, based on those assessments and where they're at um, to keep them moving forward so they're not stagnant. And also the ones that need that extra help from the previous unit to make sure I can meet with them too and put them in a group that way. Um, but one of the biggest things we do talk about is that it has to be a flexible group. They have to be able to move in and out. This is not there. You're in this group and you're stuck in it. Um, doesn't matter what we're doing because every need, every need changes throughout each unit. Um, and then another part of it for me is a, engaging activities. Um, we got our laptops at Cannonsburg mm, a week ago now, and the engagement, obviously, by them all having their own devices, it's changed dramatically with workshop, because they all have that independence, and you'll see how things are set up. They really feel like they can move through the different activities at their own pace um, in a way that works for them. So I'm making sure that what they're doing is applicable, and I know Matt's going to talk about too, but for their stations, they have different places that they go, and typically, it depends on the day and the lesson and the group of kids, um, but typically they have something independent, something with a partner, and something with a small group. Um, and our independent with the devices now are able to do Khan Academy. So they've done a test, they're put in different levels based on where they need to be, and they just work through it. It's very little work on my end to get it prepared. I just have to check in with them and make sure that they're progressing the way that they're supposed to. Um, <coughs> but the idea is that each time I get to meet with the student, so they're going to be in a small group. I've got a small group this year. So each time I get to be one-on-one -on -one in that the group with the kids so I can move to each student within their small little group and make sure that they're understanding the lesson. So they're always with me for the lesson part of it for whatever it is that they need during that lesson. Um, I'll, I'm going to wait on that. the students. Do you think they're... 
I can show you real quick. The, I asked my students today, this morning, I said, what do you think about math workshop? And I was telling Matt earlier, one of my students said, I could hear him under his breath saying, oh, it's so boring. And then I asked him later, I said, can you tell me what you think of how we do math? Not math in general, how we do math. So he's one of my ones that I videotaped, so. Um, I like math workshop because I think it's a lot faster than my younger grades um, was because um, we would always do group work and I thought that was very, very slow. So then a uh, fourth grade came and I really liked the, the math workshop because we do station by station one by one and I thought that was really fast, cool, and really fun. So. I thought it was very fast. It was faster, and I liked that better. I liked math workshop because um, when I was in lower grades at first and third, I had to go and like if one of us needed to go to this station, all of us had to go to that station, and if one of us needed to go to another station, we had to go to that station and go back and forth, and back and forth. But now that we're like now that Mr. Nets actually like planned it out and we actually don't have to like keep going back and forth and back and forth and made it more easier and, and, and more better and I it's more and I can communicate more like if one of us need to talk we just raise our hand and they actually listen unless when you're like a big group you can't actually like do it and I can really talk because it's actually better and actually makes me feel better and I like math workshop because we get to rotate in groups and we get to interact with one another. We like to play prodigy, watch videos over concern. And if we, whenever we switch, we go to a different group and do something different but with the same group. He's a perfect example of my student who needs to move. So that idea of just moving around the room. Um, is a big thing for him. I'm gonna let you go ahead. I'm gonna talk about kind of my help. So I do pre and post tests. Every student in my class takes the pre test. And the reason for that is kind of twofold. One, I get to see where they're all at, but on that pre testing day, the students that may not have understood all the skills from the previous chapter, it frees me up time in my math time to work directly with them, read, uh, evaluate them, catch them up, figure out where they need to go in a perfect half hour setting. So I pre and post test of the unit and that helps immensely. Pre to post test scores are anything between 20 and 40% all the way as a post test to 85 to 90. 100%, and it's amazing growth, and the students feel so successful with it. The flexible groupings, so each unit, I do some flexible groupings, and I'm gonna kinda take you through what I do. So, up on the board, I use my objective from my math lesson, and I convert that into my purpose statement. I say it out loud to the kids, I have them repeat it back to me. So my purpose for today is to use benchmarks to estimate sums and differences of fractions. As a fifth grade skill set, that's a big deal. So we break down words that are there, we do some different things that are within that, and we figure out that vocabulary. The students that are broken into some fun math named groups, I have my math pirates, I have everyday I'm calculating, and I have two infinity and beyond. So I have my three math groups based on just some fun naming techniques. And then with that, there's a color code that follows. So blue is my number one, um, this uh, purple is my number two, and then green for my independent. So my with me group, my partner activity, or my independent. And the students in the math pirates would move with me to a partner and then independent. And if you can kind of see what that is, this is the group that needs the most instruction in this model. They need the more with me. Then they're ready to go work with a partner. Then they're able to show their independent. So for the skill set, I'm just using what's in the math journal this time. So page 88 is going to be done with me, and that's based on our purpose statement. My partner activity is going to be a game, or it could be another page activity. And then the independent, 
I like to use 10 marks. So I use the program 10 marks, which is more Common Core themed, and I can use a specific objective to match within the independent portion. That is about the technology use that I have, is the 10 marks. Everything else is done a little bit different. So in my class, we do a math notebook. We notebook every lesson. So every lesson, the students go through with me in my new lesson. We identify vocabulary. We work through a problem that's specific within the math message, or we talk about other things. This ranges from 10 to maybe 20 minutes, depending on the day, to make sure the students are really aware of what it is that's needing to be done. I leave this projected on the screen when I break into my group so we can reference back to it. Maybe it's a vocab piece, maybe it's just a math piece, maybe it's anything. So we work our way through this math notebook with my mini lesson. We get into our groups. In my low tech, I'm sitting on the floor and this is how I'm doing math. I have my whiteboard. I'm sitting on the floor doing math on my whiteboard with them while they're doing their journal pages. I can have specific conversations with them. I've gotten really good at writing upside down and backwards. And the kids are often amazed by, how did you do that math upside down? Well, don't worry about that. Let's figure this out. So using this low-tech strategy to keep me going through. So the mini lesson with the math notebook. And I'll show something that I'm doing with this math notebook in a little bit that's pretty cool. After I'm done with my teaching day, after school, I videotape this using my own. I go through, read the purpose statement again, go through and articulate what it is that we've learned in the objective, and then I give a homework help using my own. Push it out on a Schoology, and my students that are struggling with math, if they're not bringing this home with them, they have the ability to hear my voice going back through the mini lesson that we did in class and having that homework help every night at their pace. They can hit pause on it. They can hit fast forward if they get it. They can continue to work on their math skill set in any way that I need them to. I have a lot of students that sickness has been starting to take over in the room. And when they're missing this, it's kind of hard to catch them up when you've done this really cool elaborate lesson. Now I have these videos that are forever saved in a space that I can go back and help them work through that. So again, with the groupings, we move through. 12 to 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the date and how much time that we need. And we wrap up either with a Schoology quiz, if I have devices, our building doesn't have devices at all. Um, but I was part of a pilot, so I did have access to devices the last two years. So I could do a Schoology quiz check-in or just pick a problem that's on a journal page. If we work together, I'm omitting that one and asking the group, okay, this is your exit slip. Show me how you've done problem number four, or you get math box number five, whatever it is. So those videos, the mini lessons, all of this starts to connect those kids in. And I did, like Laura did with her videos, something different, again, no technology, but I asked three questions of my students today. Math workshop, why is it different? What do you like about it? And how does it help you? And I'm gonna pass around some of their responses. And as you peek at it, what stands out to me is there's confidence. Students have the confidence to say, I actually can ask a question, or I can figure out math at my level, or I can do a little bit more with it. And it just gives me that opportunity to let them be vulnerable in math, where sometimes many of them want to struggle, and they don't want to answer the problem for fear of getting it wrong or they don't want to ask the question because they don't want to be looked at in a different way. This approach gives me that opportunity to go a little bit further. So why is it different? It's different because I get to know them. I know them as a math student, not just as the end of the unit, they blew the test. I know what's happening before we even get to the test. I know what they need based on the check-ins, based on working with them. I'm seeing the successes that they have. What do you like about it? Many of them say collaboration, or working together, or moving around. And how does it help you? They're seeing their own success. From the pre to the post test, it's huge for them. They're going, wow, I am getting this. And they're feeling confident. I had a chance to ask a few students that I had 
last year. What did you think of that model? And many of them would say, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it because I am now in control of my math. I've got it figured out a little bit better. And that's a big thing. I just want to add on too, as Matt's been talking, as thinking about what workshop might look like for you and how you might be able to use it in your classroom. I think one of the most important things to think about is, obviously Matt's been doing this for a long time. I've been dabbling in it for a long time. And I think that sometimes it can be overwhelming looking at, oh, I have to prepare all this extra stuff. And I think if you look at the math um, curriculum right now, it so easily lends itself towards this type of teaching. Um, by being able to split up, and even if the starting point is to just say, okay, we're going to have one group do a game, we're going to have one group do the math boxes, we're going to have one group do the lesson, so that you have things that are already ready for you. You don't have to have the technology. Um, it certainly adds to some of the things, but it doesn't have to be there. Um, just to set it up in a way that works for you. So I think that's important to think about, too. <coughs> I have a question. Yeah. And you may have already said this, you may have missed it, but um, what period of time, what length of time do you have for math workshop? I use 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the day. And then my mini lesson, I try to keep 10 minutes or less, but that's really quick. Mm -hmm. And it's, when you say pre and post test, are you using the Chicago math pre and post test? You did tests? Yeah, I use, yes, that's what I use. Yep. Is that what you use? Yep. Yeah. Are there any other questions? In Schoology, I'm using just the simple technology that we have. I have my Elmo. I had to purchase a microphone, which is just a gooseneck microphone. This plugs right into the computer. And after school, I put my math notebook under the Elmo. And I used the technology that came with the Elmo to cut the video. So my math notebook is open. Then I press play. I was going to show last night's, but last night they were taking all the technology out of my room. So halfway through the video, a gentleman walks in and says, hey, how's it going? And I stop halfway through. So we have two parts to last night's, but I'll show the night before. Students have access. They know how to get in. This would just be an <coughs> opportunity to see how I can use the tools. Today in class, our purpose was to rename mixed numbers and fractions greater than one by composing and breaking apart holes. In our math notebook today, we began with an example. We wrote the idea out as, write 21 over 5 as a mixed number. Students were given a chance to think about what to do, and with that, we used some division strategies. We then defined what a mixed number was, a whole number and a fraction. The strategy that was given to us by one of the students was to take in the division house our dividend of 21, and the house divider, and outside the divisor of 5. How many times does 5 go into 21? We were able to do 7. I'll keep hitting play and we'll do a little bit more, but how many times do we have parents say, I don't know how to do this math in my hand? Yeah. I don't know how to go through this because the language is different. The language isn't that different, it's just the strategy to build towards that skill set. This bridges so many gaps because now the parent can see what we did in class, and now how it translates to the success of their student at home. And it goes in four times for 20, with a remainder of one, four and one fifth. This is a mixed number, representing 21 over five.
four and one fifth. We continued with some examples at the bottom, 43 over seven, all the way down through 22 over three. We decided that if we used division to help us, we were able to create a mixed number, a whole number with an answer as a fraction that followed for the remainder. We then applied a new strategy for turning a mixed number into improper. We identified the whole number, the numerator and the denominator, and we took that mixed number and we decided to take the denominator times the whole number, giving us our answer, and then adding that to the numerator. That gave us our improper fraction. So to apply it to this number of seven and two thirds, we took seven times three, or three times seven, it's 21, plus two more is 23 over three. Using this strategy, we were able to rename fractions that were mixed to improper, but also check our work later on. In tonight's homework where we're renaming fractions, one of the things that we can do is we can look at this idea of trade. I talked about trade in class, but we also... The video would continue, and I go through and I talk about the homework, and the homework help. And now a child can pause here, work on their homework, and then it's me helping and guiding through the homework at home. And the child can work at their pace, they can hit pause, they can replay as many times as they need, and all I'm using is the technology given to me in the classroom. It's my Elmo, and it's a gooseneck recording device. That's it. And I'm just using the skills from class and helping them to apply it at home. And when I think of the range of classes that we have here, from kindergarten all the way to fifth grade, that Elmo, you could create a station as a kindergarten or first grade teacher videotaping yourself, your voice, manipulating through a strategy that you're trying to do that day. That in turn could become a station, but the child's hearing your voice now. And they're seeing you do the manipulation. And they're able to access it on their iPad at that kindergarten first grade level. For those second through fifth grade teachers, what a neat thing to do to even have kids come up. They could stand up last recess and explain to their peers, this is how I solved the problem, or this is what I was doing to work through something. And they can then in turn apply their strategies and share them through the use of what technologies we already have. There's nothing in addition that we really have to get for this. If we continue with our slides, setting up Schoology, <coughs> and we wanted to include this because we wanted to aid in that technology piece. How do you incorporate Math Workshop possibly using the Schoology element? For our novice, it's just setting up a math folder, maybe links to EM4, or math game sites or sites specific to that unit. And that's very simple and basic in its understanding of getting ready, but it'll empower you to go forward with it. If you're right in the middle, you can have those unit folders. Sites used um, based on chapters objectives, or sites used based on chapters objectives. You can find more specific elements to work through and help your students. And then if Schoology is your focus and you want to have that tech component, individual folders and lesson folders, help videos, extensions, juicy problems, all of those pieces can be added or aided for a student to work through math. So if you ever have that student that does test out or goes beyond or needs more, the folders are set up and the videos, if you create them, or places to go are there and available. So some ways to consider how to get set up. We have some helpful websites, but I think it would also be helpful just to kind of see how maybe Lauren or myself set up our Schoology. I don't use Schoology so much for math in the sense of within the lesson because I don't have the technology all the time. So I would be more of the right in the middle. I am more, I guess, experienced in other places with the Schoology, but math was never my true focus for using Schoology until more so this year. In my Unit 1 folder, I created a Google slide presentation that I could allow myself to direct my talk, my talk or my discussion through. 
I have my math video lessons that I've been creating since the start of the year. So again, parents and students can go and check that out. Typically after 4.45 every day. And then I have some volume simulators. My students struggled with spatial design. And we manipulated in class and we used cubes, but sometimes those students want something different. So I found some sites. This one's included in the group that we pushed out for you. It's called Voxel Builder. And what it is, it's a place where you can create in a 3D setting. So your students that need to know how to manipulate or do math in a different way, if they're not getting how to build with the small cubes in class, but they can see this because they play Minecraft, I can manipulate and I can build in a 3D setting and I can manipulate the page and spin it around and I can see it on a different platform or plane. And now I have the ability to connect with all my students because they look at this sometimes as a game. So you're like, this is awesome. Can I stay at recess and do this? Sure, if you tell me the value of what you make. Now all of a sudden I've extended one. But again, the device gives me that opportunity. So lending itself to having that look and find stuff gives you a little bit more. Oops. There's another site in here, if it will pull up for unit one, that I also wanted to show, because this is a great place for students to practice a little bit more. Volume Simulator, really in turn, is Build with Chrome. If you've never heard of Build with Chrome, it's Google's working with Google Maps and Legos. And students can go into this space anywhere in the world and build a 3D Lego creation and map it created. But again, my extension, if it opens, was build something and tell me its value. If it wants to come, maybe you guys in the extension, you can find it too. But build with Chrome, it gives you the opportunity to go in and try to manipulate a few other things. If I go back into my Unit 1 folder as well, I do have my EM4 site available for all my students to access on the main page. So that's at the bottom. So I have 10 marks, my EM4 link, my family letters. We use Prodigy as well as a math recovery program called Mobi Maths. These are places for my students to get in and access some different things. Parents that struggle on the EM4 site, I found something that's worked a little bit better for them. So in my Unit 2, if I go to Unit 2 Study Links, and I kick this out. Everyday Math from the University of Chicago has already <coughs> recreated for us all of those study links in a PDF form with their answers per unit. And you can set up the link, put it into Schoology, and they never have a problem finding what you need. The EM4 site works perfectly for this as well, but sometimes parents just need the faster, how do I get to it? This is where they can go. If I look over here to the side, I have everything for EM4, and if I look above, it's all the home links or study links from kindergarten through fifth grade. And it has answers for each of the study links, and it's current with everything that we're teaching. So if I click on this, and I have a student that's at home and they can't get into the EM4, or if I needed to teach something a little bit longer and I haven't changed my planner in EM4, a student might not be able to get back to a lesson that I've done in the previous time. If I don't have the time to go fix that calendar, they can go right here, print what they need, and continue on. So this link as well is included in that resource section for the school group that we have. So these are some ways in which I've set up a little of my math workshop using the technology. Again, I have my multiplication check-in, my long division check-in. These are built in Schoology. And what I can do is I can push a quiz out. I can have the students do it in one of the rotated groups. And I know immediately how they're doing. I have juicy problems if I want to extend my students and ability to go further. 
This is the little hub for them to explore and know more about math. But it's done all within this workshop with most of the time me sitting on the floor doing my math on my small whiteboard. But this helps as I go through. Well, Lauren, show what she does in her room. There's only a couple of things I want to show real quick. So one of the things that we found troublesome as we were going through, my math folder is set up, um, it's broken down a little bit just differently, but in unit three, which we're in right now, maybe, <laughs> But I set it up by folder, so each unit is a separate folder. So within each folder, they have their activities for the day. So what they're doing, the page, different assignments. I also started doing quizzes through Discovery Ed last year, um, just gave me different ways to get information. So that's the same type of thing that Matt was talking about with the quizzes in Schoology. Um, but one thing that we found to be really helpful that we just started using is this symbol U page. Um, um, it sets it up in tiles so that all the kids have to do, and this is on our main page of the school gym when they get in, so all their math links are right over here in the corner. So all they have to do is click on it, it's in one location, it's always there, and it takes them right to the pages they need to log into. Um, we've also used it, you can see on the side there, there's our safe searching sites, um, all those and story and core clicks, so everything is on there as just one place. So things that we commonly go to or commonly use, um, we just put right up on that page and it just keeps those links there for them, just easy to access and click. Um, instead of them saying, well, what folder is it in or where do I need to go, then they always know they just go right to this page. Um, I don't think there's anything else in here. Does anybody have any questions for us? I feel like it was just a lot of information. Yes? Can you put the access code back up at some point? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. About how long are your daily videos? My daily videos? Yep. Uh, five to seven minutes. So it's just me sitting down, hitting record, mm -hmm. five to seven minutes, save it, push it out. For five to seven minutes, if I can help at least one kid. Right now, it's only like one kid a night that's like, yeah, I want to make a video. I'm like, thank you. Please, <laughs> yeah, that one kid. <laughs> but now it's starting to catch fire. And because I just had conferences, I was able to tell parents, hey, if you need some extra help at home, these videos are available. And I have a parent in the room. Would the parent in the room like to even share? <laughs> How have the videos impacted your own home life? Well, um, we have used them, and um, I hate to say it, but I kind of maxed out at like third grade for my math abilities. I was able to teach my child, so he um, gets very frustrated, and my way of explaining it is obviously not as good as Mr. Zogel. So um, one day we got really frustrated, and we finally remembered, let's go have him reteach it to us. And it was just awesome. My son and I were both sitting there taking it all in and it's so nice and paced that he can follow along and um, you know it's not too fast but like so you can pause it and rewind it and fast forward so it, it is really an awesome resource for parents. And we already have the technology in the room. You have the element. Yes. What was that microphone piece that you bought? I just I went on Amazon and I bought the highest rated, cheapest microphone. Okay. So it's just a gooseneck USB plugs right into the device. I can tell you from microphones too, because so my husband's IT. I bought mine at Salvation Army for dollars and yeah. And mine's a handheld, all the frames, a handheld that he is standing for. But if you, if you go, I mean, you can get them stuck at hand, you can go to some of the tech stores too, and they've got mics, and if you want something just to, to noodle around with at least a machine, it's a cheap I well. What I found is my earbuds were working very well last year. This year with the new devices that have come in, something has gone awry. So my earbud with a microphone component isn't working the same. So that's why I went the gooseneck, I just set it up at my desk, and it's already lent itself. We do a genius hour in class, and I have kids now making podcasts cool. using this. So it's, I'm getting more use out of it than just in the classroom. 
Any other questions? So again, I'll navigate this for us as well. In the group, there's a resource section. In the resource section, there's folders that are set up. So we're good on the corner. Resources. So the things that we've talked about, I've given out the math links. It's just the University of Chicago way to access your grade level. You just copy and paste it in. Here's also 10 marks, my MobiMax, Prodigy, and Extra Math. Extra Math is a site used for helping you math uh, Math extensions, everyday math grade level, that's, sorry, that's the study guide. So Build with Chrome's in here, that voxel builder that I showed us, and Mathalicious. Um, Mathalicious is for sixth through eighth grade, but challenging our fourth and fifth graders that need that extra help. I have something here for workshop model ideas. Beth Newingham is where I grabbed my initial thought process. I have in that folder how Beth sets up her map, and then some ideas from other districts with videos. So if you're like, I'd like to just dabble with this for a chapter, how can I get started? I heard some great things here, but I need that reinforcement. Here's your chance to find Beth Newingham. She's from Michigan. She does a great job. She now is contracted through Scholastic, so it reverts you to a Scholastic site, but it'll give you a lot of starting point information. You'll see a lot of what I do in Beth, and it's just a way to kind of bridge that gap. And then back into resources again. I have just something for exit tickets, some examples. So I created a math exit ticket in Schoology. It's just a three question quiz, so you can just see what it could look like, as well as a PDF version. So if you want to just have paper pencil, you can print it off, and I have some examples of what I would do for a chapter. So it's all pre written out for you, so you get a chance to see that. And then at the bottom, I have our folders. So first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and kindergarten. If you guys have stuff you want to share with each other, here's a place to put it. If you have great ideas, if one of your team members is making the video for a lesson, now you share it. All these videos are shareable. Anybody that teaches fifth grade, you can have them. I mean, that's how cool this space is now, the school of GPs. If I'm putting in effort, putting in the work, and you're doing something else, and now we're collaborating as teachers, we're cutting down energies and time. And I'm digging from different departments as well. When they start to pull stuff in for us, now we have the ability to go further with it. Because my energy was here, and now I can grab more energy and do something more. So again, here's a place to kind of work. I have a little discussion thread in here as well. And the discussion thread is just basic. And we'll just do a turn and talk at our table. Where do you go from here? Where do you go from here? If you're in Schoology and you're logged in, add in the discussion. If you're not logged into Schoology, turn and talk to your table. Where do you go now? What's your next step? Please.